Let's just pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word and your word is truth. And Father, I pray that as we tackle this subject today, that people's hearts and minds would be challenged and opened. I pray that by your spirit, that you would minister and, and, and let truth break through. And Father, I pray that your will be done in our lives and in our hearts. And we thank you, Father, that you're always with us in Yeshua's name. Well, today we're going to be talking about the word law and biblical law. This would have to be up there as one of the most misunderstood words in our Bibles. The translation of the word law has caused much confusion, erroneous doctrines, and a misunderstanding of the Bible's original intent, original meaning of this word. Law is an English word trying to convey a biblical meaning. One of the problems is that the modern world view and the modern meaning of the word law often, more often than not, has a negative connotation in our languages and societies. We think, when we think of the word law, we think of authority. We think of being bound up, restricted. Other examples, for, uh, for example, if one breaks the law in our society, there's, there's often a fine, a penalty, and in severe cases, even jail. There is a negative emotion and ideal when we use this word and when, we, when this word is spoken about. A real experience of this idea of, of negativity and law and restriction and fear and, and everything else that goes with it is, is think of this, when we're driving along in our car and, a, and the police drive past coming in the opposite direction and what do we instinctively do? We, we look down at our speedometers to see what speed we're doing and if we're over the speed limit, inevitably what happens next is we look into the rear vision mirror to see if the policeman turns around and has his sirens blaring, chasing after us. And then this creates fear and anxiety and, and I'm, I'm caught. And that's what happened. That's a real world life example of this negative emotion that's tied to this word law. We then carry that over, that modern westernized emotion and understanding of the word law when we read it in our Bibles. We then carry that over and, and place that same emotion and that same ideal when we read the word law in our Bibles. And then we get, oh, it's restrictive, it's bad, it's, 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 it's negative, it's to be bound up. The biblical meaning of the word law is positive and good. It is designed to produce blessing, health, and prosperity in our lives. But this can only be seen and understood from understanding the Hebrew word and the Hebrew mindset and the Hebrew concept for the word law. But first, I want to touch on one of the Greek words for law. The Greek word that is predominantly used for law is nomos. And it means anything established, anything received by usage, a custom or a command. So it's any law whatsoever, whether that would be Mosaic law, according obviously to the context. This is important to understand as law does not just automatically mean law, the law of the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, or Yahweh's word. Which, friends, it's all the same thing, the Mosaic law, Yahweh's word, the Old Testament, they're all the same thing. It is the word of God. Nomos, the Greek word, is used for the customs and laws of the land as well. For example, the Greek laws and customs, or Roman laws and customs. 
It is also used for traditions and customs of men. For example, the rabbinic customs and laws, the rabbinic traditions, which are also referred to as the traditions of the elders or the oral law that was passed down. But what needs to be understood, these are not the word of God. Rabbinic traditions, the traditions of the elders and the oral law is not the word of God. Neither are they the Mosaic law. For the Mosaic law and the word of God is the same thing. It was God's word and, and that was given to Moshe to write down and record. It wasn't Moshe's words, it was Yahweh's words. But it's often referred to the Mosaic law because Moshe, Moses, wrote them. These are the law, the, the, the tradition of the elders and the oral, the oral law, these are the laws that Yeshua often opposed when he was rebuking or having discussions with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or different scribes. This often gets confused with the Old Testament law. They are not the same thing. They are the customs that have been added by man. You know, nothing has changed today. Every church denomination and independent church has added their traditions and customs. There's nothing new under the sun. It's happening today. That's why there are tens of thousands of different types of denominations today. Here are some examples of nomos. Matthew 5, verse 17. And he says, Do not think, this is Yeshua speaking, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So in this context, Yeshua is talking about the Torah, the Old Testament, the first five books of Moshe, and the prophets and writings. He's saying, do not think that I came to abolish those laws, those nomoses, those commands. He says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, in this verse, fulfill does not mean done away with or finished with. The doctrine of man that twists, that twists this verse to say that the law is finished, that doctrine is anti-Semitic. It is replacement theology that goes hand in hand with the doctrine of demons. Man has come along and twisted these meanings and created this whole erroneous doctrine that has uh, caused much confusion and much misunderstanding of Yahweh's word. Another example is in Acts 18, 15. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. So this is an example of the law being their own man-made laws, traditions of the elders. And we could just simply go on and on and on with many different examples of the word law throughout our Bibles. But a couple of things to take away from what we've just discussed. When coming across the word law, especially in the New Testament, it is imperative, and I can't stress this enough. First, it is imperative, it's context, context, context. What law is the particular passage or verse referring to? What is it talking about? Is it God's law? Is it the law of the society, the Greek law, the Roman law? Or is it the man-made traditional laws and customs? So first you need that when you come across the word law in the New Testament, you then first need to establish and identify what law. 
Was it a custom? Was it a tradition of the elders? Or is it Yahweh's word? We just cannot take every account as Old Testament law. You, you can't do that. A side note, which we will deal with another time, is that there is another Greek word used for law also on a few occasions, and that is the Greek word dogma. And that is another teaching on its own, and we'll do that at another time. But I encourage you to, to, to actually study this word dogma, as it, is, uh, as it is very important to make the distinction between the uses of the two Greek words, nomos and dogma. Now, let's get into what the biblical meaning of the word law is. The Hebrew word for law is Torah. That's the Hebrew word, Torah. And this means law, direction, and instruction. So it is a positive, good view of law. It's not negative in, 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 in any form. It is positive. In the Hebrew culture and mindset, it is the teachings and instructions, whether that would be from Yahweh or from parents to a child. You know, the Bible calls us the children of God. So it's the instructions that a parents give a child. Well, friends, we're the children of God. Yahweh is our father. He's our Abba. They're his instructions, teachings, and directions for us to live a blessed, peaceful, prosperous life. Because we are the children of God. We're his children. So they're for us. So the sense is instruction and teaching. When one fails or breaks an instruction, then they are disciplined or corrected by Yahweh or by the parent, depending on context, to do it better next time. It has a guiding aspect. Not you broke the law and you're going to be fine and you're going to be punished forever without any compassion or mercy. That's, that's erroneous thought. That's erroneous doctrine. That's not the Father's heart. The Father's heart is to teach, to guide, to discipline, which is a positive thing. It's not this, this attitude of being without mercy and without love. In Genesis 26, 5, here we have an example of the word Torah. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Now, aren't we supposed to be like Abraham and have the same faith he had? This verse shows very clearly what that faith involved. It was following his ways, his words. Another example is Psalm 119 verse 1. And it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of Yahweh, or the Torah of Yahweh, or the instructions and teachings of Yahweh. Blessed is that person. So again, we see a positive view of it. Psalm 119, 72. The law or the Torah teaching and instruction of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Quite different to what, how it's taught today. Another example is in Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your Torah. I love your teachings. I love your instructions. I love your guidance. It is my meditation all the day. Now, there are 25 occurrences of the word Torah in Psalm 119 alone. And every single one of those 25 occurrences is positive. 
and it's tied to life, blessing and peace. There are several times in Psalm 119 it is used in direct contrast to those who are wicked, deceitful and liars in the sense that they are those who do not keep Yahweh's laws. They are those who do not keep Yahweh's teachings and instructions. I encourage you, do a little exercise and go through Psalm 119 and replace the English word law with teaching or instruction and you will start to get the sense of what Torah means in the eyes of Yahweh, in the eyes of God. We know David was a man after God's own heart. His view of God's law, God's Torah, or God's teachings and instructions is very different from the modern doctrine that the law is done away with, it's evil, it's restrictive, it's to be bound up. David's view and experience was complete opposite to how we view it today. And this was a man after Yahweh's own heart. He never, ever, ever saw the law as negative and bad. Yeshua himself backed up the Old Testament Hebraic view and understanding of law. And I must add that the New Testament believers also had a Hebraic mindset and understanding of the same word law or Torah that the same believers in the days of Yeshua understood Torah to be positive and not negative. Matthew 7, 21-23 Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. To far from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, this is such a powerful passage of scripture. Yeshua advocates for being lawful, not lawless. And this passage very clearly spells out what that means. Another example is in Matthew 24, 11 to 12. The many prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Wow, another powerful passage. Think about this for a moment. To say that God's teachings and instructions are done away with is implying that God failed, his word failed, and that God made a mistake. That's inevitably what you're saying. For, for people to say that, the, 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 that God's word and God's Torah is done away with and it's finished, it's implying that he made a mistake and that he was wrong. The ones to, that hold to this doctrine of men and demons are who Yeshua is talking about in these passages. They are lawless. They are lawlessness. What does that mean? They are without law. They're without God's teachings and instructions. These verses explain our world in this day and hour. Hearts are cold and hard. Why? Because they are without law. They are lawless. They are without the teachings and instructions of Yahweh. Why? Because the doctrines of men and demons have come in and said, that's all finished. That's all done away with. We don't need to do that anymore. Well, friends, in our society today, we're experiencing the fruit of that. This is what was behind Paul. When he says God's law is holy, just, and righteous. 
Paul never advocated that the law was bad or evil. He never said they were done away with. What Paul does teach, however, is that the penalty of breaking the Torah, breaking the law, which is death, has been dealt with, paid for, through the shedding of innocent blood, which that we know that that blood is Yeshua, our Messiah. It is the penalty that has been done away with, not the law itself. The penalty, the death penalty, the, the penalty, the fine for breaking the Torah has been dealt with, not the Torah itself. We can learn a lot from the pictograph meaning of the word Torah. And here we have the pictograph meaning. Starting from right to left, we have the, the, the Tau, which is like the, the cross. Then we have the Wow, which is like a, a hook or a tent peg. The Reish, which is the head of a man. And the Hay, which is like a man with his hands lifted up in awe or in worship and praise. Or saying, behold, look at that. And this is the, the pictograph word Torah. Now the beauty of, of, of Hebrew, that each letter has a meaning. So the Tau means the sign, covenant or mark. The Wow is a nail, a hook, which connects and attaches things. The Reish is the head, the leader, the beginning, the firstborn. And the haze, praise, revelation, lifting of the hands, or look, behold. So combine these meanings, uh, the, when you combine these meanings together, it means that the nailing of the firstborn, the leader, reveals and brings revelation of the sign or mark of the covenant. And it can also mean behold, the leader, the firstborn nailed to the cross. Quite powerful, isn't it? This is the word Torah. This is what it does. It brings revelation and understanding. Why? Because it teaches and instructs on how to follow Yahweh. It brings revelation of what happened on the cross. It brings revelation of who Yeshua is and what we should be doing and how we should be following and worshipping Yahweh. Now the root word of the word Torah is Yara. Yara, a Yoda, Rash, and a Hay. And this means to throw, to shoot, or to cast. Like, for an example, when an archer shoots an arrow. Or when rain is cast forth from the clouds to the ground. It has that action. It's a verb. It's, it's that throwing, casting, shooting, action. That's the root of the word Torah. To cast, to throw, to shoot. We see this picture here. Exactly what the Torah is. It's the, it's the mark. Or a target in the Hebrew mindset of the letter Tau. We touched on this before in the pictograph. The letter Tau is a target, a mark, a sign in the Hebraic thought. When an archer shoots an arrow, it hits the mark. It is good. When an arrow hits the mark, it is good. That is what the teachings or instructions of Yahweh are designed to do. They are to cause us, they are to guide us, they are to be like that arrow that causes us to hit the mark, which is Yahweh, which is Yeshua, which is the covenant. To be blessed and prosperous in all that we put our hand to do. The target is Yahweh, not the Torah. The Torah is the instructions and the, the teachings that help us hit Yahweh. The Torah is the arrow that guides us to hit the target. It guides us towards Yahweh. Now we need to know what missing the mark is. Did you know that the word sin, which is hamatia in the Greek, 
is an archery term for missing the mark or target. It's a failure to hit the mark. If the covenant is directly connected to the teachings and instructions of Yahweh, to say that these are done away with is a sin. It is missing the mark. Yeshua, Paul, or any of the other apostles and disciples of the first century never, ever advocated for missing the mark. Or that the teachings and instructions of Yahweh were done away with. It, it's, it's never said. They enforced the covenant. In the book of Acts, there are many, there are so many times Paul is defending the Torah of Yahweh. Throughout the book of Acts, it's over and over again, Paul is repeatedly defending the Torah, defending Yahweh's teachings and instructions. How do we know this? The, 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 the uh, Orthodox Jewish people, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious ones of the day, they were continually accusing him of breaking the Torah. And Paul is continually defending himself against these accusations. He's saying, no, I'm not breaking the Torah. I'm upholding it. They are accusing him and he's defending himself. If, if Paul felt that the, the Torah, the law, was done away with, he would never have been defending himself. He, there would be no need to. But we know throughout the book of Acts, he continually defends his himself against these accusations. The law, more accurately in the Bible, like we've discussed, means the teachings and instructions of Yahweh, and they are available for everyone. Exodus 12, 49. One law. Again, the word Torah. Teachings and instructions. Shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So it's one set of teachings for all people. One set of instructions for all people. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it explains that these same laws, these same teachings and instructions will either be a blessing to you or they will be a curse to you. They are the same teachings. If you do them, you will be blessed. If you choose not to do them, you won't be blessed. It is amazing to me that the Bible traditionally has 613 commandments, both positive and negative. And a lot of people don't know what they are. But a lot of people that advocate for the, for the doing way of the, the Torah, they, they don't even, many of them don't even know what they, what they are, the laws themselves. Because they rarely read the Old Testament. That, that, that's not relative anymore. That doesn't apply to us anymore. So they very rarely read it. When, when these laws are read, I don't think there would be much argument that they are restrictive or bad. Actually read the laws and see what they say. And... I don't think there would be much argument to say that, oh, these are negative or bad. In our societies alone, we have thousands upon thousands of laws at local, state and federal levels. And we all run around trying to obey those laws and get all upset when, when some people start talking about the laws of God which are for our benefit. And with that being said, most of them are for us anyway. Now, I want to make this very, very, very clear. We are not saved by keeping these instructions and teachings. We are saved by the grace of God alone. And one needs to understand what grace is 
from a biblical perspective and not from a modern westernized English view of grace. But again, that is another teaching for another time. To be saved by grace does not mean that the Torah is done away with. Yeshua himself was without sin and he was righteous. How? How was he without sin? How was he uh, claimed to be righteous? He kept the Torah. He kept the instructions and teachings of his father, which were recorded in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, Yahweh's Word. He was our example on how to live. John 7, 16. Yeshua had answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Who sent him? Yahweh the Father. Who did Yeshua preach and adhere to? Yeshua kept the Torah, the instructions of his Father. When Yeshua said this, my doctrine is not my own, but he who sent me, the New Testament was not even written yet. The Torah, the law, the word of God are there to bless us in every area of our lives. They teach us how Yahweh wants to be worshipped. They teach us of special appointed times to meet with Yahweh. They teach us on how to have right relationships within marriage, families, and our fellow man. They teach us how to be healthy in our bodies and minds. What also needs to be understood, I said this before, that no one person can keep all the laws. It is impossible. As there were some for the high priest, there were some for the everyday normal priest, some were for men, there were others for women. It is impossible for any one person to keep them all. Why? Because of biology. I am a man. I cannot keep the Torah for women. Because I'm a man. The Torah of God is good, holy, and righteous for our benefit to bless us. Even at the return of Yeshua our Messiah, he will be teaching the law, the Torah, when he returns. Isaiah 2, verses 2 to 3. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Yaakov, the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Friends, this is after the return of Yeshua, our Messiah. Now this is the current doctrine. They kept the law before Yeshua. Yeshua himself kept the law. Yeshua came and now we don't have to keep the law anymore. And now Yeshua comes again and he'll be teaching the law from Jerusalem and we will be keeping the law again. Friends, this, this, this just does not make sense. That, that mindset, that train of thought does not make sense. They did it, they don't have to do it, and now we're going to be doing it again. My Bible says that God never changes. That Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not like that, friends. Friends, we are saved by grace. We are cleansed and washed from our sins by the shed blood of Yeshua, our Messiah. 
But that does not mean that the instructions and teachings of Yahweh are finished or done away with. It does mean we are no longer under the law, meaning we are no longer have the penalty imputed onto us for breaking the law, which is death. That has been removed by the death and resurrection of Yeshua. The penalty has been removed. The fine has been paid. Yahweh wants us all to live peaceable, happy, blessed and healthy lives with him and with each other. This is what adherence to the Torah gives us. It gives us that blessing, that shalom, that peace if we adhere to those instructions. Why? Because they're designed to be a blessing. And if you choose not to do those, you will not have blessing. That's what the Bible says. Again, I'm finishing on this. I say the Torah is good, holy and righteous. It doesn't save us, it blesses us. Hallelujah. Well, I hope this has been an encouragement and a blessing to you and help your understanding of accurately dividing the word of God. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a blessing. Your Torah, your teachings and instructions are there to design to bless us, to cause us to prosper, to give us shalom and peace in our minds and in our bodies, to, to cause us to have blessed relationships with, within our families and with, it, with our fellow man, to cause us to worship you the way you want us to be, the way you want to be worshipped. It shows us and teaches us special times when you want to meet with us and how to eat properly and have healthy bodies. Father, your word is so good, it is truth, and it is there to bless us. It is designed to help us, strengthen us. We thank you for your word, Yahweh. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you will help people that listen to this, grab and understand what your word says. And I thank you for that today, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.